thing. Come on up. Dearly Father, Lord, as we come now, we just ask that you would bless this service, Lord, that you would have your way. Lord, we're so thankful for your blessings. And we just ask right now that everybody that's came this way, God, that you'll just pour out a blessing upon them, touch them in a way they've never been touched before. And God, we've come to lift you up and to thank you. We know you're a soon coming King of kings and Lord of lords, and we're all excited about what you're getting ready to do. And we just ask you to bless this service now. Have your way, and we ask it all in your precious name. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. I didn't spit on it. Yours will be the only name that matters to me. Tell my story There will be 
Don't know where to begin It's like my world's caving in And I try but I can't control my fear Where do I go from here? Sometimes it's so hard to pray And you feel so far away But I am willing to go where you want me to God, I trust you There's a raging sea right in front of me Once you pull me in, bring me to my knees So let the waters rise if you want them to I will follow you, I will follow you you'll be next to me you're in the eye of the storm and the calm of the sea you're never out of reach god you know where i've been and you were there with me then you were faithful before you'll be faithful again i'm holding your hand there's a raging sea right in front of me Wants to pull me in, bring me to my knees So let the waters rise if you want them to I will follow you, I will follow you Holding on to you. God, your love is enough. I will follow you. I will follow you. Today, I just want to pray as we get ready to take up our offering. This song doesn't have any music with it, but Katie asked me if I would learn it a few days ago and sing it, so I told her that I would, and it's an old hymn, but I love it because if you just let God lead you and guide you, you can't go wrong as long as the Lord is leading you. He leadeth me, oh, blessed thought, oh. With heavenly comfort fraught Whate'er I do Where'er I be Still tis God's hand That leadeth me He leadeth 
feel our troubled sea. Still tis God's hand that leadeth me. Lord, I would clasp thy hand in mine, nor ever murmur or repine. Content whatever Lord I see, since is thou hand that leadeth me. The victory's won, even death's cold wave, I will not flee, since thou through Jordan leadeth me. She's going to come up and teach. Preach. Teach. Again, God confirmed his word through the singing, Amanda's song. Thank you, Amanda. I was needing a little nudge tonight, so thank you, Amanda. And uh, I did ask Lindsay to learn that song, um, but I didn't know she was going to sing it tonight, and it confirmed it. So God's good. God is good. Um. I felt like the Lord wanted us to talk tonight about the cost of fulfilling the call of God in our lives. And uh, I'm going to pray first. Lord God, thank you, Lord God, for confirming your word. I thank you, Lord God, first of all, that you've already, God, ministered this word to me. And now, Lord God, I ask you to minister it through me. I ask you, oh God, to open up the hearts of the people and let them draw on this tonight, God. Let them see what you're trying to tell them, God. And I ask, God, that you use me tonight, Lord God, for your glory, that I get completely out of the way, Lord, and what they hear is the voice of the living God tonight. Speak into their spirits, God, that it will go into their spirits, Lord, and it will change things, God, and bring them to a place where you can use the, each one of us, God, tonight. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord. Um, the Lord began to t deal with me about this when he was telling me uh, about how people, you know, we see people come to this altar all the time and say they've gotten saved. And a lot of times we never see them again. And if we run into them and ask them, where are you going to church at? A lot of them will tell you, I'm not, oh, I'm not going to church. 
But I'm still serving God. I'm still saved, but I don't go to church. And uh, the Lord began to deal with me about that and, and uh, tell me, you know, there's two types of Christians. There's those who come and they get, they, they repent at this altar, they ask Jesus to save them, and then they go wherever they go and they sit down and they wait for Jesus to come back and pick them up. And basically what they want is fire insurance. They don't want a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because if you get a relationship with Jesus Christ, it will change some things in your life. You will, uh, there comes commitment in your life. There comes a desire to see other people saved, to minister, to help someone, to do something for God. That comes when you have a relationship with God. And there's more to serving God than just getting out of hell. And I know we all start out that way. We, we don't want to go to hell. But as the Spirit of God develops in your life, it'll turn into a um, relationship that will cause you to move into the things of God. And those people is who God can use to work and to minister in his kingdom. The ones that have just come up and asked God to save them and they, you never see them doing anything for anybody or uh, in the name of the Lord, uh, they, they don't want a relationship. They just want that fire insurance. Now, uh, one thing the Lord told me was one thing that keeps people from moving out into the things of God is when they come to God, they think there's no way God can use me. There's no way God could use me. People know where I've been. They know what I've done. And I know what I've done. And I know I'm, I'm just probably one of those people that's barely going to make it. So the devil will tell you that. He tells everybody that. I don't care how good of a person you were before you got saved. The devil will tell you, why would God use you? That's, I mean... He wants you to get in your mind and can figure, because if we do that, we're going to come up short, right? <laughs> I hope nobody thinks they're good enough for God to use them. You know, God uses you. He will use anybody. And I tend to believe from reading the scriptures that God likes to get a hold of someone that's, that the world and their friends, their family have looked at them and said, they, there's no way, there's no way, there's no way that's going to happen. And when God gets a hold of them, he changes them into what they need to be. So it's not about how good you are. It's not a God, about how I thought when I was a sinner that I had to clean myself up before I could come to God. So I tried several times. I'd try to turn over a new leaf, but it didn't work. <laughs> It doesn't work that way. Salvation is free, but it costs Jesus everything. It costs him everything. It's not cheap. It's free. It doesn't cost you. It costs Jesus. Now, your salvation is free, but fulfilling the call of God, and every one of you, me included, has a call on your life that God wants to fulfill on this earth. Doing that is going to take everything you've got. It's what it took Jesus. Everything he had when he came to earth, he had to lay it aside in heaven or he had to uh, give it up on this earth. And if you fulfill the call of God in your life, you'll do the same. Now, some people will say, well, pff, I'm not called to do nothing. Maybe you're a, you drive a truck for a living. You can be the best truck driver there is. You can get in that truck and you can bless God for that truck. You can bless all the people you come in contact with. You can be the biggest ministry that a truck driver can have. A nurse. So a lot of nurses think, well, I'm not, called, I'm not called to do anything. Being called to do something for the Lord or having a call in your life doesn't always mean in this building. See, there's some people that's called to be nurses. And, the, and if you ever run across a nurse like that, you'll know. 
She's got a call of God on her to do that. You ever run across a truck driver that's called of God to drive a truck? A person that works in a hotel that's going to open the door for you? You'll know that person has the anointing of God on them to do that thing. So it doesn't mean it went, what we get in our mind when we first get saved is that being having a call on your life means you're going to be on this platform doing something. And that may or may not be true. You, you can be called for many, many things. You, if you're a doctor, you might be called to be a doctor. God has people everywhere doing all kinds of stuff. Now, Jesus told us in Luke 9, 23 through 25, Then he said to the crowd, If any of you wants to be my follower, you sang about that, didn't you? <laughs> You must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross daily, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but are yourself lost or destroyed? So the first thing he wants to do is to tell you when you get saved, turn from your selfish ways. And most of us don't think we're selfish, do we? Do we? <laughs> no, no. If I was to come to you individually and say, "Are you a selfish person?" I'd say nine out of ten of you, maybe all of you, will say, "No, I'm not selfish." But God says we need to turn from our selfish ways. We need really to let God reveal to us how how we act selfishly, because a lot of times we don't know what is selfish. Then He said, "Take up your cross daily and follow Me." And he asked me this question, what is there in your life that you would be willing to give your soul for? Because when we don't follow him like we should, that's what we're doing. You know, I could ask you tonight, how much money would you take for one of your arms? And it would probably be an exorbitant amount. Or it would be, I wouldn't take nothing from my arms. You can't have my arm. But so quickly, we lay down that call because it's going to cost us something. It's going to cost us to lay aside our selfish ways. It's going to cost us picking up our cross and carrying it. <clears throat> I want to ask you to uh, tell you about what it cost Jesus. You know... He had to carry a cross. What did it cost him? It cost him the privilege of staying with the Father. Now, all of us know where Jesus was before he came to this earth. He was with his Father in heaven. In heaven. And um, he never knew sin until our sin came upon him after he came down here. He took limits on his own self by be, being put inside of a flesh body. That had limited him. When he was in heaven, he could do, go th and, and maneuver and do anything he wanted to. So when he took on that body of flesh, he put limits on himself. And the worst thing was, he came here, he suffered and died as a criminal for us. Let me ask you this. This is how I heard it one time, and I've never forgot it. You're on a porch maybe one day, and how many in here like ants? No, not many of us, do we? And you're watching these ants, and they walk over here to this edge of this, and they fall over, and they just keep coming, hundreds and thousands and thousands. They just walk over there, have no idea that when they get to the edge of this, they're going to die because it's a long way down, and they're going to die. And all of a sudden, you hear a voice that says, or you hear yourself saying, they're suffering, God. They're suffering. They don't, e there's, they don't even realize they're headed for destruction. And God says to you, what if I would put you in one of their bodies and put you down there with them, and you could talk to them, but... They're going to torture you and kill you. Are you willing to do that? And then, even after torturing you and killing you, 
they're still going to, not all of them is going to believe what you told them. Would you go for that aunt? Would you go and let yourself be put in an aunt's body, which we normally detest? We don't, we really don't understand or We've never lived as an aunt, so we can't understand an aunt. But we would be required to go live as one of them. That's what the Lord did. When God looked down on us and seen that we, are head, we were headed for destruction, and the only way was for God to come and take on a body of flesh and tell us and steal some of us. Won't do it. That's what it costs Jesus to fulfill the call. Philippians 2, 5 and 8 says, You must have the same attitude that Christ had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. That's exactly what we would have to do to save those ants. That's exactly the attitude we would have to have. John 17, 5 says that, Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. When Jesus was in heaven, he shared glory. He had glory. Let me, let me uh, try to make us understand. I really can't even comprehend it all. But, but the Lord spoke to me about this, and he said, you know, he never knew sin. Can you, you, we can't imagine not knowing sin. We can't imagine what sin doesn't look like. We can't imagine how it feels to be around sin. I remember when I was a sinner, sin was pretty good stuff. Now, after I got saved, I started getting a little bit more. The more longer I was saved, I got a little more aware of what sin was in that it made me uncomfortable. I didn't like to be around it. But can you imagine having never known sin and then being put right smack dab down in all this sin? And not only that, being willing to take it on yourself. To take on the God, the King of glory, to take on our sin. But we're supposed to have that attitude. We're supposed to have the attitude of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we don't even have the attitude to help one another. Sometimes we would rather stay home than to even be with each other. You know, if we had the attitude of Jesus, we couldn't wait to be here. And you know what? We would come through that door thinking, I want to be there tonight because I want to help you. I want not, well, they're not singing my song. They're not, my favorite preacher ain't preaching. That's not the attitude Jesus would have had. If he come through that door, he would come in here to minister to you, to each one of us. And that's the attitude we should have. When we come in that door, we ought to say, Oh, God, I, I'm, I just want to help somebody tonight. You know, you just smiling at them. You just hugging them. You just being here is an encouragement to the other person. If you look at these empty seats tonight, it does not encourage you, does it? And you know what? Most of our minds, we know who sets where. We know who's missing. It bothers us. It bothers us. But we have to have the mind of Christ. We have to have the same attitude he would have. So we need to come in here thinking, oh, God, I'm coming because I want to be a help to somebody. I want to help somebody. I want to encourage somebody. First, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 said, For God made Christ who never sinned to be this offering for our sin. Now, from what I've read in uh, Scripture, Jesus wants to send us out like they, the Father sent him out. He never said, get saved <laughs> and sit down and wait on me. He never said that. You know, uh, 
the people I know that have come to God and have a, a working relationship with God came in ready to say, God, take his life. I goofed it up. I messed up. I, ooh, it's a mess. And try to do something with it. They didn't come in and say, well, I guess I better get my fire insurance. I guess I better talk to Jesus about me not going to hell. They, they know they want to, they know they've destroyed what Jesus Christ gave them, a life. And they come to him and they say, God, get a hold of me and change me. Because only God can do that. If you, you, I tried to change myself, it didn't work. It does not work. So if that's what someone's trying to do, it don't work. You pray and ask God to help you change. Jesus put heaven aside in order to fulfill his call. And you're going to have to put something aside. There's things in our life today. Some of us uh, have uh, illnesses that uh, we allow. They, if you ask the world, they would keep you from being effective for God. But if you ask God, he says, go, go, do, do. If you're sick, you can do. If you're ill, you can do. Do what you can do and let God do what he wants to do in your life. But the thing of it is, you're going to have to push something aside out of your life. Sometimes we have so much going on in our life, we don't have time for the things of God. I've done that too. Now, and then other things is, what are you willing to submit to? Submit. We don't like that word, do we? No. Especially wives don't like that word. <laughs> they think that means um, that they have a, a uh, ruler over them. That's not what it means. Submit means you recognize the authority and you're willing to bring yourself under that authority. It's like your pastor. You recognize he's the authority in here. You may not agree with him, but you recognize his right to make the decisions, and then you support him in the decisions. That's submission. Now, <clears throat> John 20, 20 says, Peace, he, he said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. Let me ask you something here. When you hear Jesus say, I am sending you, when you come to this altar to get saved, how many had it in their minds that Jesus is going to take this mess that I brought to this altar and he's going to fix it up and clean it up and, and uh, uh, kind of remodel my life to where I look like a Christian? That's not what he does with you, honey. You know what he wants to do with you when you come to that altar? He will kill you. He kills you. That person won't never live again. That person dies at this altar or that person is not saved. It takes a dying. Look in, well, let's look at Galatians 2.20. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's what he's got in store for that sinner. They're going to die. If you didn't die at this altar, then you're not saved. He crucifies you. That person dies. That's why when the devil comes around and says, who do you think you are saying you're a Christian? Who do you think you are trying to act all holy and, my, and uh, like you're a good person and stuff. You remember what you did last week? That's when you say, uh uh buddy, that person got crucified. That person don't live no more. He's dead. Jesus killed him right there at the altar. That person's gone. He'll never be again. You'll start all over. Galatians 5.24 says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. You have to know in your heart that
that you are not an old person doctored up or cleaned up. You are a brand new creation in Christ. The old person you was died, is gone, and the devil will try to resurrect that person every day in your life. He will try to come to you and tell you who you are by his standards instead of God's standards. And that's where you take the word of God just like Jesus did. When, if the devil come to Jesus on the mountain there and said, If you be the Son of God. Now, if he had the guts, whoo to, <laughs> this cross just don't stay there very good. <laughs> if he had the guts to say that to Jesus, what do you think he's, he's not going to say it to you? If you think you're a Christian, you're crazy. Christians don't act like that. Yeah, we do sometimes, and we have to get forgiven, don't we? We have to go back, and we have to say, God, I don't want to be like that. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to change me. But that's what the devil does. Now, the last part of this is about the two views of the cross of Jesus. We have two different views, the world's view and we have God's view of the cross of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction, but we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. So the world's view is that a man dying on a cross 2,000 years ago is foolish. If you think that's going to affect your life today, if you think it's going to do anything for you today, that's merely foolish. That's what the world thinks. But God says it like this. It was my call, and it is the power of God. That's what he said the cross is. The very power of God is the cross. The world thinks it's foolish, but we know it's not. We know it's the power of God. Now, whose ideal was the cross? It was God's ideal. Man, or the world says, all pe mean people thought it up to go crucify the poor Lord Jesus. And he was so pitiful. And, and don't you feel sorry for him? That's what the world view is. And, and you know, at Easter time, a lot of them will come to church just to, because they feel sorry for Jesus because he got crucified. Because mean people did that to him. But this is what God says in Acts 2.23. God knew what would happen, and his prearranged plan, his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. God prearranged a crucifixion. Man just fell right in line and did it. But God prearranged that. So, you know, we don't need to... To look at Jesus carrying that cross and, and feel sorry for him. He was doing the very thing he was called of God to do. And what we need to do is just thank God, thank you that Jesus was willing to come down here and do this for me. Not, I feel sorry for poor little Jesus. No, people, did, people I'm going to tell you something. There was never a time on his, when he was on earth he couldn't have stopped at all. He could have stopped it all. It's just like you. You can stop it all. You can stop the work of God in your life. You can stop the call of God in your life. You can stop it. Anytime you want to, you can walk out that door and not ever come back. But you'll be one miserable person. Thank God he, Jesus did not stop. This was what he was sent here to do. And I want everyone in this room... I pray to God that this moment right now and for the next few days, however long it takes, I want you to think and I want you to talk to God about what he put you here for, what he put you on this earth for right now in this time. We, we sometimes stop and think, oh, man, it, now's the time when we need all them uh, apostles and and all that did all these great things in the first church. And wouldn't it be a great time to see Apostle Paul and Apostle Peter? No, 
Jesus put you here right now. You are the one that he's counting on to go out and do this thing. You're the one that's got the call of God on your life today. Today. You're the person. Now, it, you need to get alone with God, and you need to say, God, why'd you put me on earth today? Why'd you put me in New Life Church? What am I here for? Why am I here? What do you want to do with me? What have you prepared me for? You think you had a rough life? Honey, that was your preparation. Jesus had 33 and a half years, and sometimes when we lose someone that's young, we think, oh, my God, that's not right that they died. Let me tell you something. It took Jesus 33 and a half years. When your time, when you fulfill your purpose, or whether you don't fulfill your purpose, he said that your hairs on your head are, are numbered, and your days are numbered, and when it's your time to go, if you ain't done what you're supposed to do, you going anyway. Who wants to stand before God and say, oh, God, I didn't do what you told me to do because I didn't know. Ask him. Ask him. What are you putting me here for, God? You're here for a reason. Why are you here? You need to know. I hope we all know what we're here for. I know what I'm here for. I'm here to torment y'all. <laughs> I'm here to try to explain to you what serving God for 45 years I have acquired in my spirit that I'm to determined, like I told him at Bible study Monday night, I ain't leaving here with this stuff inside of me. I'm getting it out. Because when I leave here, I want to go and say, Lord, I give them everything I had. I gave it all to them, God. I didn't hold back. I didn't make it easy. I don't care if I offend you. Woo. I don't care. If God tells me to say it, I'll say it. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Now, the pain of the cross, world's view. This is what the world saw that day. Weakness in our Lord, in our Savior. They saw weakness. They saw people hurting. And let me tell you something. He, they're going to hurt you too. They're going to hurt you in this very house. I'm going to tell you something. We hurt each other. We don't mean to, but we do. We hurt each other. We let each other down. But the thing about it is, if God told you to be here, be here. If What if Jesus said, hey, I ain't going down there. They'll hurt me. You know. I told y'all that time about this woman when I wanted to go to this certain church and I had went there before and, and got a little bit bogged down with all the, the jobs they give me. And uh, she grabbed me that night and she said, Oh, don't go back there. They'll use you. They just want to use you. And I said, That's what I want. I want God to use me. I want Him to pour me out like oil. Just pour me out, God. Everything he's put in you, let him pour it out of you. Every one of you has got something in you that I need. Every one of you. That's why you're here. God put something in there. And I told Jacob Sunday morning, I'm going to dig around in every one of your lives till I get it. You got something I need. A pearl of great value is in you. There is some gold in deep down inside of you that I want, that I need. They need it. They need it. Every one of us needs it. That's why we need to be here. We need each other. It's not so we can be entertained. It's so we can be the church. Thank you, Jesus. God's view. This is what God said. When he looked at that cross, this is what he was thinking. The same thing that he told Paul when Paul came to him and Paul said, I've got a thorn in my flesh. I've got something that bothers me. He said that really what he said was it was given to him to make him humble, to keep him humble. Now, a lot of people have speculated that it was a disease, that it was this, that 
Nobody knows what it was. We don't know what would humble us, but God does. But he came to God, and he and it says there that he had three times, different times, I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. You see, you think you're weak. Glory, God can use you. If you think you're all powerful, God can't use you. If you think that you can come up here tonight and that you could just uh, speak and, and tell everybody anything you know about God and all that and that it'll break chains in their life and deliver them and set them free, God can't use you. But if you know when you come up on this platform that you have an opportunity to let God tell people what he wants to tell them and you know that it's if, if they only knew the weaknesses you have in your life, it would hinder you. But Paul, uh, he told Paul, he said, my power works best in weakness. You've got something wrong with you. Glory to God. You're the one he's looking for. He ain't looking for the perfect person. He's not looking for the woman that looks like a little doll baby that can speak exactly right, but she don't know a thing about the spirit of the living God. He can't use her. He wants the one who maybe her looks turn you off. But my, the power of God that's in them. You take them little old women, used to have them buns on their head, and, and uh, they'd come to church, they brought the power of God with them. Now, by the world standard, they wasn't all that. <laughs> but man, when they got turned loose in the Spirit of God, you, got, you knew they had been with God. Praise God. So he told him, he said, my weakness. So Paul said, so now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. So I'm going to tell you now what you, what, uh, what you need to overcome. The very thing that you don't think you can ever overcome is what it takes the grace of God in your life everybody has something they don't think I'll ever make it through this Lord I'll never be able to bring you glory because of this thing but in the grace of God, I'm going on, Lord God. I'm going to move for you. I'm going to do what you said I needed to do. I'm going to believe you, God. I'm going to believe you. I'm going to believe the grace of God's going to carry me through. I may not be able to do it. Every one of us has something. We don't tell each other a lot of times because... Each other can't handle it. I tell Lindsay all the time, people can't handle all your junk. You can't tell them all your junk. Some of it they can't handle. Because we want people up here or people that minister to us, we want them to look perfect, don't we? We want them to look like a Christian. We don't want them to have anything they're struggling with. I'd rather have someone that's struggling, but they believe with all their heart that God is setting them free, that he'll set me free, that he'll set you free. I'd rather have them lay hands on me than any fine preacher in a three-priest suit that thinks he's all that and then some. You give me somebody that's struggling, that's had to take one step today and not know how tomorrow they're going to take another one. I want that person. That's who God wants to use. We're all like that, but we hide behind our church face. Now, death on the cross, what the world seen, failure. Everyone saw Jesus die. Hey, he was supposed to be the Messiah. He was supposed to be coming here to set up a kingdom. Here he is hanging on a cross dead. 
The world sees failure. He failed in their eyes. God's view, victory, life. The cross was the only way that you and I could be born again. Only way we could get eternal life. And God, I believe, was shouting in glory. People say, oh, he had to turn away because he was so sad. No, he wasn't. He was shouting. He planned it and he believed it. When, the, when he died, what he had planned all along came to pass and he wasn't, he wasn't upset. He was happy. He was happy. Jesus had fulfilled his mission on this earth and God had planned the mission, why would God have to look away? We try to make God feel like us. Now, I couldn't, prob I couldn't watch my son go through that, but I ain't God. I couldn't plan for my son to go through that. Could you? No, but I ain't God. It was God's plan. He planned it, and I believe he shouted. I believe he shouted when he said He's done what the Father told him to do. And he does the same thing when you do it. Now, it was it the worst or greatest event in history, the cross. The world says it's the worst thing that could ever have happened to Jesus. But God says it was the greatest weapon in the hand of Jesus Christ that destroyed the devil. That's what the cross was. It was the greatest weapon Jesus Christ carried to destroy the works of the devil and, in fact, to destroy the devil. Now, let me ask you this. What's your cross going to cost you? Because he said, pick up your cross and follow me. What's it going to cost you? Everything. It's going to cost you everything. If you ain't willing to do it, you're never going to carry your cross. We need to go to God. We need to go and say, God, I want to carry my cross. I'll give up everything. Show me how, God. We don't know how, do we? We really don't. What are you willing to lay aside? And what do you think taking up your cross means? I've heard this all my life, haven't you? Take up your cross. Take up your cross. I never heard anybody tell me what my cross was, though. <laughs> anybody ever go to church and the preacher say, do this or do that, but he don't tell you how. And you leave there, you're thinking, I want to do it, God, but I don't know how to do it. Well, I'm going to tell you. Your cross represents the thing that the enemy tries every day to destroy you with. It's always there. It's lurking. It's like you see these cartoons where this evil is lurking around and moving around you all the time. That's that cross. That's that thing the enemy's trying to destroy you with. That thing that you think, oh God, I'll never get past it. I'll never make it. I'll never be able to do that. God took what was meant to destroy Jesus. That cross was meant to destroy him. The devil thought he was destroying the son of the living God with the cross. But God took it and he used it to destroy Satan. And he will take your cross. Every one of you. All of you look nice. But I don't know. I don't know about your cross. I don't know about the nights that you thought you'd rather be dead than live like this. I don't know about your childhoods that was awful. I don't know about the pain and the hurt you've suffered. I don't know about how many times you've been disappointed. I don't know about that. But you know what? God can use that. He can use that very thing to destroy the enemy in your life. Every time you take up your cross and you say, God, I can't do this, but do it through me. God, I don't know. I don't know how. I'll tell you, 
Uh, I sent out a lot of prayer requests today because I tell you, I don't know how I'm walking tonight, but I'm walking. Glory to God. And I t- that's what I told the devil today. Today I couldn't walk. Today I was at home like this. And every time I did that, you know what I'd say? You're a liar, devil. I'm going tonight, and the anointing of God is going to come on me, and I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do here tonight. Tonight. Now, I don't know what's going to happen after I leave here. (laughs) Because I've had this pain in my hip now about two weeks, and it is the kind of pain that makes you holler day and night. But... God knows I wasn't going to let that keep me out of this place tonight. I wasn't. Because this is what I was supposed to be doing tonight. This is where I was supposed to be tonight. And every time you take that thing the enemy meant to destroy you with and you put it in God's hand and you let him do what he needs to do through you, you bring glory to God. You bring glory to God. Don't ever let the people's view. See, the people come to you and they'll say, I don't know how you're making it. You, you've had a hard life. You know, I don't know how you do the things you do. That's what the people say to you. But you know how you're doing them. You're doing them because God's grace And he's taken that thing that meant to destroy you like the cross was meant to destroy Jesus. And he's turning it into a weapon that destroys the enemy. Now, there's one more part of this message. And this was in Matthew 27, 32. I don't know how many people have read this. But it said along the way, this is talking about when Jesus was headed to uh, to be crucified. And he was carrying, he was... uh, going to carry his cross to that place where they was going to kill him and it says along the way they came across a man named Simon who was from Serene and the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus's cross I want you to notice the words there the soldiers forced him Jesus did not ask him God did not compel him the soldiers forced him now The world will try to convince you that you need help carrying your cross. Some of us think, oh God, I can't do this unless I got this pill. I got to have this pill, God. And and everybody say this, Katie is not telling you to take your medicine, okay? I believe in medicine, I believe in doctors, I believe God gives. I'm talking about when you think that you can't do what God wants you to do or be willing to do it unless you have something on the outside to help you. Instead of leaning on God, leaning on that. Maybe it's a person. Maybe it's sin. God, you know I... You know, God, I can't go the rest of my life and not do this. Now, you know, I don't have the strength, God, to do that. I got to have that, God. You know, we go to church with people like that. We go to church with people that think, I got to sin. I got to be able to do this sin, God. But I still yet love you. But that sin, I can't lay it aside. I can't lay that aside, God. I can't submit that to your hand. It's too hard. We don't need that. We need to carry our own cross. And you, the, the Simon said here that Simon carried, was forced to carry Jesus' cross. What Simon did was he carried a wooden beam. And that's all people can do in your life. They can't carry the real cross. See, the the wooden cross, the beam, wasn't his cross. His cross was his will. His will. He was willing to lay it down. 
and that's what yours is. And nobody can carry that cross but you. I don't care who tells you, you need this. You need this person in your life to make it. No, you don't. No, you don't. If God brings people in your life and they're there, wonderful. But don't ever get to thinking, I, can't, I couldn't lay my, I can't carry my cross unless you help me. No. It's your cross. You've got to make up your mind. What are you willing to do? Jesus gave everything he had. Everything he had, he gave it. Are we willing? Are we willing? You know, I wonder sometimes, just what are we willing to do? Sometimes I look at, uh, look at uh, all of us Christians and I think, we're so spoiled. We're so spoiled. My goodness. We think sometimes it's a drudgery to come to church to do the things that is required of a Christian, that we dread to do those things because we think they're so hard. When we ought to have the attitude, it's an honor. It's an honor right now. And we may lose this opportunity of coming together. We may lose it. We may lose uh, the privilege of having a Bible. Some of us has got 40 Bibles. We might lose that. Because we don't have the attitude Jesus Christ had when he came here. He came here. He had a purpose. He went and he did his purpose. And he knew it was an honor. It's an honor. Every one of us, God honored you when he saved you. Because he said, I can do something with this one. See, the world says you're no good. The world said, before you ever come to God, you are worthless. And God said, no, you're not. I can use you. I can use you. I will use you if you will just be willing to have that attitude. Have that attitude. Now, tonight, I'm going to pray, and then we'll... If you want to pray and seek God, this altar is always open. But I hope that when you go home, you think about this. You think about, God, why am I here, and what do I need to lay down? What do I need to push aside out of my life in order to be in your will? See, God, God, God's got a plan for every one of you. Every one of us, God has a plan. And we go through this life like, well... I'm just here. We think we make the plans. But everything that's ever happened to you, God can use for his glory if you'll give it to him. If you'll give it to him and say, here, God, you know, that's what God, Jesus did. He gave it to God. He gave his spirit to God when he left when he died on that cross, he said, into, into your hands, Father, he give his spirit. That's what we had to do. We had to be willing to search our hearts and know what your purpose is. How can I fulfill my call? You can't do it. You can't fill my spot. I can't fill yours. But you have a purpose. And uh, please... Don't ever, ever let the devil or the world convince you that God cannot use you. He can use you if you're willing. Have that attitude. Let's pray. Father God, tonight, Lord, you know every one of us. You know everything about us. I ask you to search our hearts, God. I ask you to dig around in us, oh God. I ask, oh God, that when we lay down on our beds tonight, Lord, you speak to us about the purpose you have for us, God. Speak to us, God, about the things, Lord, that you've allowed in our lives, just like you allowed that cross in Jesus' life, God. I ask you to cause us to know what you allowed and cause us, oh God, to want to give it to you tonight. 
I ask you, Lord, if there's one in here, Lord God, that's ready to make that commitment to you, that you would just move in their lives in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. You know, when I hear things like that, I hate sometimes just going home thinking, well, okay, they got a bad hip, let's just go pray for them. But uh, we're going to pray for that hip, amen? And uh, God doesn't bring sickness, Satan does. Right. And Satan will do these things to hold us back and to keep us from doing things from God. And we're going to pray for those of you who like to come around and pray. And she sings that song, if you have a need, bring it to Jesus, amen? Amen, yes.
Okay. Um, on Sunday, I'll have a tote sitting outside in the hallway, and I'm going to make some um, copies of this and set it out on the Welcome Center. But Regina had a great idea. Um, the Veterans Homeless Shelter in Charleston needs donations, and um, they need things like, there's 12 items, bags of popcorn, the small bags of chips, um, granola bars, instant tea bags, hot chocolate, sugar-free packs, uh, the tiny little soaps that they give out at the homeless shelters, um, razors, washcloths, blankets of any size, sugar packets, and single packs of coffee. And I'm going to give the stuff to her, and she has to turn it into the lady at the homeless shelter by December the 1st. So for the rest of October and the whole month of November, we're going to be taking this stuff up. And like I said, I'll put a, um, a large tote out in the hallway on Sunday, and I'll have these out there too. So any donations would really be appreciated. Good word, we all bear a cross. Amen. Sometimes it gets heavy, don't it? Amen. But Jesus wants us to keep on keeping on for him. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let us all stand. We'll be dismissed. Amen. I'm going to ask Sarge to dismiss us there. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for yes, another dear blessing Lord. in your house tonight, dear God, that you have used Katie to bring another uh, word, dear God, and it may have reached the uh, people that it needed to reach, dear God, that we could all take this into yeah. our lives, dear God, and use it in the way that you need us to use it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.